Hallelujah. I am so thankful to be here with you all this morning. Um, greetings to you all, to the church, to the leaders. I praise God for this opportunity we've had all weekend to spend some time together and dive into the scripture. And so without wasting any time, we're going to dive right in. If you've been with us Friday and yesterday, um, you know that we've been diving through this idea of gospel identity. What does it mean to have an identity that is rooted in who Christ is, the Christ that is living in me and therefore living in that identity. And in doing that, we've been and walking through the story of Job. If you know the story of Job, you know that he went through so many different kinds of struggles. We started off talking about the presence of sin. Friday night, we spent a lot of time saying sin exists in the world. That is the reality of our human condition. Yesterday, we spent a lot of time talking about the death of the sinner and how it is our responsibility to put to death the sin that exists in the world, knowing that it exists right? That is our responsibility. Today, I pray that we would open our eyes to see and hear about the glory of a Savior, because it doesn't stop at sin. It doesn't stop at the sinner the Savior has redeemed. Amen? Amen our Redeemer, the Savior. So if I can give you a little overview, if you weren't with us the last couple of days, I want to set the stage for what we're about to talk about. The presence of sin, that is a reality, right? Struggle exists. And I cautioned you because I said the enemy's tactics to steal, kill, and destroy look different today than they ever have before. Then we said as a, as a sinner, our, the death of the sinner, in order to put to death the sinner, there is a responsibility. We have to make a daily choice to put to death the sinner. And there are these items of wellness that we covered. And finally, we ended off last night saying we need to reclaim what the enemy has stolen, right? The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come to give life and life in abundance. So as we go into today, I want to set the stage because when the Savior shows up on the, sc on the scene, it's because we needed him, right? But then sometimes without a full grasp of who the Savior is, is, we will not be able to give him the glory, give him the praise that he is due. So I pray that at the end of our time together that you are renewed in your understanding of who the Savior is, that our hearts and our minds would be opened to the holy of holies that is before us today, the glory that is before us today. Because you see that in the Old Testament, when Moses and God's people came face to face with God's glory, their faith shown, right? It, they couldn't leave unchanged. So as we enter this conversation today, my prayer is that we would all, all of our minds and our hearts would be open to seeing and experiencing the glory of that Savior. We're going to get back into the life of Job. We're going to wrap it up. We've been talking about Job the entire weekend, but I'm going to read to you a few verses from chapter 38. This is finally right, Job. We know that everything was stripped away from him. We know that the friends talked to him for about 30 chapters. We went back and forth in dialogue, and Job is essentially asking God, God, I need some answers. I am righteous. I don't understand this. I need some answers. So then finally, chapter 38 of 42 chapters, God shows up. And what does he say? I'm going to read starting in verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. All this time, was Job was the one asking the questions. So Jesus, God shows up on the scene and goes, I'm the one that's going to ask you a few questions. It goes on, verse 4, it says, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, God comes and goes, do you even understand what you are asking, Job? Do you know the magnificence of the one that you are questioning, Job? And you see that God starts to make it very clear in several chapters following this that I am so much bigger than your mind can even comprehend. We go on in verse 40, there, God talks for a little while. In verse 40, what does he say? 40 verse 2, it says, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? 
He who argues with God, let him answer it. Then verse 3, then Job answered the Lord. And what is his answer in that moment once he's been confronted with this almighty, powerful God? What is his answer? He says, behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you, God? I lay my hand on my mouth and I am silenced, right? Job was silenced. I have spoken once and I will not answer twice, but I will not proceed further. Notice the response of Job when God finally shows up on the scene and says, Do you even comprehend? And Job has no answer. Why? The glory of the Almighty God was so great that Job's mind could not even begin to comprehend. And yet he had gone all these chapters asking questions, asking God for an answer. We go into verse, chapter 42. I'm jumping around here for the sake of time. 42, verse 2, it says, and the, Then Job answered, and the Lord said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. If we skip down to verse 7, it says, After the Lord had spoken these words, he rebukes what the three friends have said. And finally, in verse 10 of chapter, the very last chapter, 42, he says, And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before twice as much as he had before. And sometimes we look at the story of Job and we draw this conclusion. I don't know about you, but growing up, we learning about the story of Job, we know that Job suffered. We know that God was maybe testing his faith and allowed the enemy to go and test him a little bit, right? And then at the end, we see this, this beautiful conclusion to the story where Job is given double, given double of what he had originally lost. Now, mind you, he was one of the richest men of, of that time. So giving double, that's huge, right? So you see the story and you think, wow, God blessed him for his struggle. God blessed him as a result of having gone through struggle. And sometimes I think we draw the wrong conclusion about the point and the theme of the story of Job. The story of Job is not just about suffering, and then at the end of suffering, you should all expect to receive twice what we had lost. That's not the point of the story of Job. What is the point, right? You see how Job says, God is unjust, I am innocent. The friends show up and say, God is just, so you must have done something wrong. And Elihu says, God is just, the suffering is for your growth, and everyone had gotten it wrong. Why? Because God shows up on the scene and he says, you can't even comprehend. You do not know who you are talking to. Are you listening to me, church? The God that is in our midst, the holy of holies, the king of kings, we cannot even comprehend. We, in our human minds, cannot even comprehend. The point of this is not that in your suffering that one day you're going to receive double. That's not the point. The point isn't that God was testing Job. Job. God already knew that Job was righteous. The point is God is almighty. Period. God is almighty. We see the scripture when Moses comes face to face with God and he says, then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? What does God say to Moses? I am who I am. There is no further justification, no further explanation needed because it ends with I am who I am, period. I am Yahweh. I am Yahweh. Your mind can't even comprehend. You want to answer to the people? The people will not even understand. So stop at this, Moses. I am who I am. The conclusion here in the book of Job is not what I said before. The conclusion here is your words, your understanding, your experiences can never, ever measure up against Yahweh. Can never, ever measure up against the almighty God. The word Shaddai, El Shaddai, we know the meaning. It means almighty God. Do you know, church, that the word Shaddai is used 31 times in the book of Job and the rest of the Old Testament, it's only used 17 times? 31 times, two-thirds of the time that the word Almighty is used, it is in the book of Job. Why? 
The point of this book is there is an almighty God in our presence. There is an almighty God. And sometimes we make life about our own comforts. Sometimes we make life about our own struggles. Sometimes we make life about what God isn't doing for me. And the story, the moral of the story is not any of that. It is not about you. It is about the almighty. I mentioned a couple of times the last couple of days that in my understanding of the goodness of God, I was, it was revealed to me that the goodness of God is not about my comforts, is not about me having all the good things of life. It's great that I have a good family and I have children, I have a house and I have cars and all of these things are good. But if the goodness of God in your life is not translating to you walking and working in the purpose of your gospel identity, it is for naught. It is not enough for us to just sit with the things that God has given us because there is an almighty that we are to answer to at some point. Notice at the point where Job repented, his circumstance had not changed. His circumstance had not changed at the point he repented. Okay, but your knowledge of the Savior, his knowledge and his perception of the Savior, what did that draw him to do? It drew him to be silent because he had nothing else to say. There is no one of us that can stand up against an almighty God because our minds cannot even begin to comprehend. So as we have been meditating on this verse throughout the entire weekend, I am going to ask you, church, would you declare Galatians 2 verse 20 with me? We read it last night together. I'm going to ask you to read it with me this morning and claim it because we've got to start reclaiming what the enemy has stolen from us. So read it with me, church. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It is no longer my desires, my happiness, my comforts, my successes that live. It is Christ who lives in me. It is the almighty Christ who lives in me, and that our minds cannot even begin to fathom. So if we have been given this life, if we have been given this life, we better use this life for Christ. We talked about how important it is to know the reality of sin. It is important for us to acknowledge and see the ways the enemy is moving and, and has its, his way in our play, in our world. And we talked about knowing our responsibility to put to death, to stomp on the, the plans and the, the, the plans, the purposes of the enemy. But now, as we stand in this new life, redeemed by the almighty God, redeemed by a savior, I pray that our lives would be useful, that our lives would not be so focused on the comforts and the, the suffering and all the things that the world can distract us with, but this new life would be useful for your, his glory. Where, you know, this is a very common verse that we get from the book of Job. What does it say? For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. There is a glory coming. There is a day coming when the Lord will come again, and we will all be held accountable with what he has entrusted to us. And I pray that on that day, the one that I, we will all be together, but also that we would be found to be a good and faithful steward and servant of what has been entrusted to us. I'm reminded of the words of Brandon Lake's song, Gratitude. If you've heard it, these are some of the words. It says, so I throw up my hands and I praise you again and again because all that I have is a hallelujah. All I have, I've got nothing else good to offer my Savior, my Redeemer, Almighty God, but a hallelujah. Praise be to God. And look at the next verse, right? I know it's not much. 
It's nothing. Not, I've got nothing else fit for the King of kings, the Lord of lords, but to say holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And one day every knee will bow. One day every tongue shall confess the magnificence of the Lord of lords, the King of kings. Amen. All that I have is a hallelujah. If one thing you can take from this whole weekend, I pray in every suffering, in every storm and valley and mountain that you face, that you would keep on singing hallelujah. That we would keep on praising because we do, cannot comprehend the God, the almighty God of the universe is still worthy of our praise regardless of our circumstance. So I'll end with this. Glory to God. Am I suffering? Am I hurting? Are things going wrong in life? Glory to God. Is, is, it, is, is life not going the way I expected? Are my children not going the way that I expected? Is my health not going the way that I wanted it to go? Glory to God. Are we hearing this, church? No matter what our circumstance, glory to God. God. The words of revelation is what I want to end today with. There will be a day where he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Your life is going to have suffering. But the beautiful news, the good news of your gospel identity is our life does not stop with what we see today. There is a glory to come. There is a newness to come. And there will be a day that let's say your suffering never goes away. Let's say this life is going to continue to give you suffering and that thorn and the flesh is going to continue to exist. That is still okay. Why? Because there is a glory ahead. And he is going to make all things new. He is going to wipe every tear. He is going to get rid of all pain and sorrow. So let's be faithful, church. Let's be faithful with what we've been entrusted to walk in the purposes he has for us so that our lives would scream glory to God. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you that there is a glory to come, that there is a glorification, a new life that we get to have as children and co-heirs with your son. Father, what a privilege. God, we are not deserving of what you have given to us. We are not deserving of the grace you have so freely bestowed upon us. But Father, every breath that we breathe, every word that we speak, every step that we take in this life, Father, may it boast of who you you are. May it boast of the life, the new life we now live as a result of our Savior, our Redeemer, Almighty God. And Father, in every suffering, in every trial, in every step that is ahead for each of our lives, God, let our, our hearts and our words and our mouth scream glory to God. Hallelujah. Let us continually praise you, Father, through every circumstance. And Father, while we are on this earth would you give us all that we need your holy spirit empower us equip us with all that we need to be able to run this race well we give you the glory in all things and we ask this in jesus name amen, amen. can we all stand for worship